our second lunch keynote, I'd like to welcome Michelle Sakurka. Michelle is the president of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. Um, she's formerly the deputy commissioner of NJDEP, um, and she was a principal player in Governor Christie's charge in rebuilding New Jersey in the wake of Superstorm Sandy. Michelle was also formerly the president and CEO of the Mercer Regional Chamber of Commerce and senior legal counsel and vice president of human resources with the Automobile Association of America. Welcome, Michelle. Okay, I think if I hit the first slide, I go to my presentation. Does that work or am I getting queued up? There we are. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It is such a pleasure to join you. I wanna thank the council for inviting me today. Brad, thank you very much. Always a pleasure to be around my sustainability fellows. Um, you know, timing is everything in life, and I have to say, when I, when I got up this morning, or actually yesterday, as I was working from home at my kitchen counter, like many of us, for about 12 hours, um, I was looking at my presentation for today, and I'm looking at my calendar for today, and I realized my day got to start this morning back in New Jersey with a meeting that actually inspired me to come here today. Our new Good Neighbor Award in New Jersey. This is a program we do at BIA where we recognize new and renovated projects in the state of New Jersey. The idea of new good neighbor. So who's coming to your neighborhood? Who's your new business neighbor? What have they done for you? And it was very interesting because as I went through the 30 nominations this morning, um, it was as we got teed up for it, someone was suggesting we want to be looking at economic impact by way of how much office space are they taking and what jobs are they bringing to the community? Because those are the first things we think about when we think about economic development when it comes to business, right? Of course, the first filter I put on it was I was looking for all the um, energy efficiency in the projects. I was looking for LEED certification. I was looking for green infrastructure. Um, and so it's amazing in our worlds, we all know, you kind of bring where you are in a station in life, you bring your filter to it. Um, and a lot of that is, uh, is very interesting. As I'm leaving the meeting this morning, I'm walking out with uh, someone who happens to be on my board of trustees, and she said, where are you heading now? And I said, I'm, I'm heading to speak at a, a sustainability symposium in Philadelphia. And she said, oh, what's your topic? And I I said, I am the intersection of business and sustainability. And she just stepped back and she laughed. She said, Michelle, you are. You are. Because you heard DEP, Department of Environmental Protection. When I went to DEP, my role there was um, the sustainability queen. I loved it. I had the opportunity at DEP to talk about the intersection of environment, economics, and social. Obviously, you all know the three legs of the stool and how important that is. And so now, coming back out to the business side where I was before and bringing everything that I've learned and what I've been informed by at DEP to help influence um, and really reinforce how we move economic development forward. It's even more clear to me, I have so much more clarity around the role of sustainability um, as part of, of economic development. And that was proven out to me this morning as I went through those, through those great projects. So um, I'm gonna spend some time with you today talking about the intersection of business, economic growth, and sustainability. And really asking the question, you know, are we, are we there yet? I haven't mastered this yet. Am I pointing somewhere special? <laughs> okay. Maybe I'll just talk. Um, there we go. We're moving. I guess it might take me 10 clicks. I apologize. Let's start with the premise. Um, you know, the premise being that when we talk about sustainability, some have gotten it already, some are on board, some still aren't in the business world. Um, but when we talk about sustainable business practices, the question really becomes, are we talking about disruptive innovation or a key and driver of innovation? Now, I think we all know that answer here, but we're going to we'll go through a series of questions that I think will lead us to where we want to be. We know disruptive innovation is when we want to upset a market trend. Right. Well, we know that oftentimes um, when we talk about sustainability um, in a pretty conservative world, people are talking about things that are outside of their comfort zone. You know, they're, they're very concerned in a business world. I'm going to be uncompetitive. Is this going to cost me more money? Um, what are my clients going to want out of this? Um, I'm going to have to have new processes, new equipment. And, you know, the money and the dollar signs just keeps ringing and ringing, and it takes a lot to get them there. Uh, but what we find out is that sustainability actually becomes an innovation, you know, the new frontier of innovation, because as as we look at these issues and when we get in that scary zone, when we're in a situation like that, the first thing we do is we think outside of the box. And so let's see if we get there in, in the business world. You know, why should, now I'm going the opposite way. There we go. Okay. Why should business really care? You all know about the triple bottom line. I just mentioned it. The intersection of economics, environment, and social. But, you know, sustainability and the idea of sustainable return on investment, this is what it means for business. This is the value proposition, and this is where we go, where we try to tell business how it all comes together. You know, you gain competitive advantage, absolutely once you get there. We know reducing costs by minimizing water and energy and in your processes 
we know that translates to dollars. Um, we know when our processes are more efficient, that results in lower costs and increased profits. You know, every business loves increased profits. This should have an impact on liability and our insurance as we become more effective and efficient. And it creates new opportunities in terms of our own supply chains of what we demand from people. But also, if we're in a supply chain, we have to make sure that we're answering the needs of those that we feed our components to. Um, investors are becoming very savvy, as you all know, to sustainability. It's quite a part of the value proposition now. Um, with that, that means if you are answering the needs of those new investors who are way into sustainability, this is creating new access to you for new capital, new loans, new grants, folks who are really interested in getting in this game. Um, enhancing your image and your market share, because this is what folks are striving to and thriving for. Relationship with government. This is a big deal because, you know, government is now starting to mandate, starting, government has been mandating that we all start moving toward more energy efficiency. And with that then, um, we have the opportunity to expedite, expedite ourselves through that process. So if we know that there's going to be mandates out there and we get in front of it, um, we get through it much quicker. Of course, you know, millennials want to be attracted to sustainable businesses and communities. Emily, I can tell you, that's a fabulous project. I, I was in awe. I was absolutely in awe of that project. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's what we need to be building. Because you know what I'm hearing? What I'm hearing from the next generation of the workforce is they want to be in communities just like that. So we need to be doing all that great stuff. Thank you for sharing that with us today. And we know that when we have improvements, that leads to uh, happy employees, which means a healthy workforce, quality, et cetera. And of course, it's always just the right, the right thing to do. So now, what does this mean, this triple bottom line? This is sustainable return on investment. It's actually a change in how you look at the business model um, in terms of calculating return on investment. So the historical business model was all about those, those hard assets, right? If you look at the left side of this chart, which might be a little, now yeah, you can see it. These are some pretty big charts up here. Um, ordinarily, ordinarily, when you would look at your financial impact and your return on investment, you'd be at that left side of the chart. So you'd be looking at um, capital, operation, maintenance, that's what always was driving your financial return in a traditional business model. Okay? Now, we got a little bit more advanced from that. We started realizing return on investment in our business model was some of the internalities of how we run our business, our workforce, and things we do on the inside, health and safety, productivity, and that started feeding in. So now we had that financial interest and that you know, return on investment now taking into consideration a little bit more softer cost from the inside of the building, and that was taking traction. Well, now, now the business model is even bigger than that. Externalities are being monetized for purposes of hitting the balance sheet. And this is how we get to sustainable return on investment. These externalities are the impact on environment. And this is what we're looking at now to try to monetize. How do you monetize when you save water and when you conserve energy? How do you monetize um, the impact on the carbon footprint and things like that? This is what investors are looking for. These are things that are starting to hit the balance sheets. And these are things now that business has to take into consideration. Very different way of looking at the business model and the return on investment. And that's why we call it the sustainable return on investment. So before I was talking about you know, what's in it for business, well now, now we can really talk about those hard and soft costs in a different way. So on the left side here, we're starting to catalog what is it that is really cash-based that would be under that traditional model, the things that we can actually get you know, hard costs for. But then we see on the right side those non-cash non returns when we're more sustainable. And again, this is that soft stuff that we have to find really good ways to monetize and show return on investment. So this all sounds really good. Um, but how do we do it? You know, how's business getting it done? Are we getting it done? Is business really stepping up? And what we have to do is we, we have to ask ourselves, you know, are we planning to the current and future challenges? Are we just reacting to the current and future challenges? Sometimes it's okay, just react if you're ready to react, right? Are we adapting? Are these the things that we're doing? And we know sustainable business practices require that every level of the organization be involved in the discussion and that every piece of it runs from what the building looks like to how the building itself operates to how the people inside the building operate. Again, this is a very different proposition on how we look at things. The most important part of all this, of course, is transformative thinking, thinking different than we ever did before. Remember, different business model, people get nervous, so now we got to think differently than we, did, than we did before. Five steps we can go through to get us there through our transformational thinking. We got to apply our transformational thinking through these five steps. 
viewing compliance as an opportunity. So you heard me saying I just came from five years at DEP, so boy, don't I know it. All right. Behavior, sustainable behavior, is being more mandated by government. EPA is on it. State departments are on it. And we need to be ready to, to respond to it. Where's the opportunity in that? If you are a first mover, you have the advantage to be ahead of it. You garner a good relationship with government. And guess what? You're fostering innovation. They now see you as an innovator. Pretty big deal. And you're probably moving through your process much quicker. Making value chain sustainable. Where's our transformative thinking here? You know, looking outside the, outside the box again. Are we part of a supply chain? And what are we feeding? Are they demanding from us because of the type of product that we produce, that we do it in a certain way? Well, you bet we better be producing or we're going to lose being part of that supply chain. What about our own supply chain? Our investors are looking at who's in our supply chain. Not enough for me and my business to say that I'm sustainable. But what's really important is for me to show all the way down my supply chain that they're sustainable too. Designing sustainable products and services. Now, you all know this, that consumers today, we're all reading labels. I'm reading labels. My kids are reading labels. It's because I told them they should read labels. But it's so important, right? You, you want to. You want to buy products that are better for you and better for the environment. It's just it's, it's who we've become over time. So the marketing here is very important. We have to take a new look at how we market our products, not just how we make and produce our products, but how we market them. We take concerns of our clients into consideration. We have to understand who we're feeding with our product, what type of pro, you know, business we are and who our clients are and how they want their product delivered to them so that we make sure we're doing it in the way that they believe and understand and we are true to the fact that we're delivering a sustainable product for them. That's how we get market share in the new world. Um, developing these new business models. This is really the integration of the customer value proposition to the product delivery. This is putting it all together. We really got to be transformative here and figure out how we're going to do that, right? And of course, creating these next practice platforms, looking beyond and, and thinking, you know, five years from now, I mean, this is the hardest thing today for all of us, especially I always think about this in education. You know, we're educating kids today for jobs that don't exist yet. How do you do that? Well, same thing. You know, we need to be looking at our products and our services as how are they going to be relevant for the next five and ten years when the world is so dynamic and just keeps changing. So how do we stay ahead of that? We have to keep, you know, questioning the norm and getting outside of our comfort zone and thinking in an innovative way. Transformational thinking is innovation. And innovation drives sustainability. Anytime you get into a new business model, the perfect opportunity for great innovation, and we see innovation all over the place in sustainability, and we see investment in innovation in sustainability as being a huge driver for our economy these days. Um, we know that there is a continual plight to quality in things. And in that plight to quality, again, comes that opportunity for innovation. And we know that resources become more and more sparse every day. Dollars are limited in terms of our ability ourselves to invest. So when we do that, not only do we get a little conservative in how we do things, we have to be innovative. We have to do it different than we did it before. So innovation is about sustainability. And of course, then innovation and sustainability become a catalyst for growth. So I've been talking a lot about the individual business and what it means for that particular business, its supply chain. You know, but it's not just about the individual business. We have to look at the environment that supports the business. And right now, to really drive economic advantage, we have to go beyond the building itself and the people in the building. But how about the community landscape? Where, where are we politically? Where are we in a regulatory environment? Who's, who's accepting and who's moving? What do we need? How do we foster? Does the environment within which we are trying to grow sustainable business, does that environment foster innovation and new technology? Is the community infrastructure able to support innovative growth? And most important, are investments in community infrastructure being made? Because I will tell you, this is where we fall short time and time again. So what do we mean by this? This gets into a really serious discussion of managing our infrastructure. Because all these great projects, like what Emily showed us, if that community doesn't have the infrastructure to support it, it's going to be really difficult for that project to go forward. Any business in any community, whether it's Pennsylvania or New Jersey or New Mexico, if you don't have the right infrastructure in place by way of your water, your energy, your transportation, forget it. The business can't thrive. So when we talk about sustainability, we've got to talk about the community sustainability in order to support the businesses that are in it. Um, we know that there's major, major public and private investment 
in, in assets and in infrastructure, and we know that reliable infrastructure promotes economic development. That's how we get there. It also allows for efficiency, it allows for certainty, it allows for surety in the future. And again, without good, hard infrastructure in our communities, we have no capacity to grow. So without infrastructure, we can have all the great ideas about innovation business, but those businesses aren't going to have the ability to grow if they don't have the right infrastructure environment to do it in. This is asset management. It's like asset management 101, okay? Take a stock of what you have in your community in terms of your, your infrastructure assets, whether it's your water, your energy, your transportation. Make sure that you have a plan for, re, for keeping up in maintenance, but as well as rehabbing it, as well as rebuilding it, as well as retooling it. Um, procedures for evaluating life cycle costs for doing that, and we all know infrastructure is extremely, extremely expensive, and people get really scared when we start talking about infrastructure. It's a big issue in New Jersey right now, infrastructure, as well as everywhere. The key to this, when we look at our infrastructure, is bringing sustainable solutions at the community level as well. This is long-term planning, and we have to do it with innovative funding solutions for the future. Our problem with infrastructure all along and ideas around asset management has been we kind of, we treat the funds that are there to support that infrastructure like an ATM machine. We go and take the cash out and we think the cash is just going to keep coming. So we got to find new innovative ways in order to fund this long-term asset management for the future so that we have the right communities with the sustainable infrastructure so that the businesses can grow. What are the benefits of asset management? Knowing your system better allows you the opportunity to be informed when you make decisions about it. And it enables, obviously, cost effectiveness. Um, developers benefit from this. Communities benefit from this. Every rate payer benefits from this. And in the end, it may provide greater access to financial assistance as well. Um, oftentimes, when a municipality is taking on an infrastructure project, if they can show they have a long-term asset management plan, they may get lower interest finance, extremely important. Low interest rates are key. That's the, that's the good idea of having good funding for the future. And also states have incentive programs for that. What's a really easy example of this? Innovation and infrastructure, you all know this. Green infrastructure. It doesn't get any easier than this, right? Green infrastructure takes our natural resources and uses them in a way to marry up with infrastructure to make that infrastructure work better and be more sustainable. <laughs> Um, obviously, ideas like infiltration and storage of water, all the things that you all have been talking about all morning, because I walked into some of the sessions and I heard you talking about it. When we talk about that sustainable return on investment, this goes for the community as well. Um, the sustainable return on investment for communities, obviously, you have good environmental impact from having green infrastructure. It's always aesthetically pleasing, so social. The people are really happy. You have parks to walk in. This is very important um, in a community. And of course, the economic, because Green infrastructure, and we know because we do the homework, green infrastructure shows us that capital costs in O&M are less and you can get a project moving much quicker. I uh, should throw a shout out, I don't know if Andy's in the room, Andy Cricken from the Camden County Municipal Utility Authority has great programs going in Camden around combined sewer outflow um, and using green infrastructure as a part of it along with long-term asset management planning. Really, really great model if anybody wants to learn more about that. You know, the impacts are tremendous in green infrastructure, in this, and we know this is why communities should, should look at this. Water quality, we know the impact it has in, in, water, in water quality, especially in an area that has combined sewer, sewer outflow. Um, flooding, you know, conventional stormwater systems, they just, you know, they run the water so fast you have flooding. We know that, um, you see, you have it here in Philadelphia, we have it across the river in Camden, we have it all over parts of New Jersey. Um, but if we add green infrastructure, the idea of the flow of the water is more controlled and it uh, minimizes flooding. Of course, water supply, anytime we can harvest rainwater and reuse it at a local level, that is very, very beneficial to us. So this translates to private and public cost savings. Um, the, SO, the SROI on this again, when stormwater management systems are, are structured on green, usually they're less expensive up front and you can control the capital cost over time. We know that you also get lower sorts, uh, costs for site grading, paving, landscaping, et cetera. Developers benefit from this over time. And as I said, cities with combined sewer systems, um, this is a very 
cost-effective way for they to take on a monster, a monster of an issue. So, you know, I started with this premise about disruptive innovation or key driver of innovation. Uh, I think it's safe to say you all in this room know what the answer is, but sustainability clearly is a key driver of innovation. We have so much opportunity in the area of sustainability for new innovative technology, for new innovative ideas. Um, I'm so glad that I got to go after Emily because that was innovation at its best. Um, seeing that brought together is just fabulous, and we can do so much more of that. So that is my presentation for today, and if anybody has any questions, I would be very happy to take them. Thank you. Any questions? Of course, Brad. <laughs> yep. With not too much inside baseball, because I don't want to get you in trouble, but as you're sitting around the table at DEP with the administration, as it is or was, um, do they get it at all? Yes, <laughs> yes they, they do. They do get it. Um, there were, you know, the, there's the water supply plan that is uh, on the verge of just, you know, of coming out. Of, it is coming out, Brad. It really is. Okay, we're gonna pop champagne the day it does, but it's coming out. Um, you'll see, you'll see a lot of strategy in there. The wastewater side, absolutely get it. Absolutely get it. The combined sewer strategy in New Jersey right now, and D, I love this because I wanted to get EPA quoted, or I want to get them on tape, they said that our permits were the best in the country on CSO. Well, why is that? Because within there is built a lot of green um, technology up front because these are really, really expensive projects. And long-term control plans that have green infrastructure fixes within the first five years and show the return on investment then gets a local municipality the opportunity to get to the next five to ten years to start doing the gray. So, um, you know, we could always get it more, right, but great starts. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So you, I did a lot of uh, a lot of post Sandy work up to the day I up to the day I walked out, and I, I wish I had an hour to share Sandy stories with you because you all really want to be New Jersey's water girl post Sandy. Okay. Very very interesting time. Um, but but from Sandy, Sandy absolutely stared us down on what our vulnerabilities and in infrastructure in the state of New Jersey are. And in the rebuild, we took the time to say we got to do it better the next time around. Now, do it better doesn't mean do it platinum uber best, because we can't afford platinum uber best. We got to balance what we can afford to do and the time that we can do it, but absolutely, absolutely, the whole discussion around resiliency will drive more sustainable programs. That's a great question. Thank you. Yes. Um, Michelle, thank you for your remarks. I absolutely love your sustainable return on investment uh, schematic. And uh, just what, what's the history of that very specific concept and, and scheme that, that captures the more full cost accounting of a sustainable approach to business? I think that the, I think the history is that folks who are true to the issue and have been in business for, you know, decades, a decade plus, and have seen this uh, need to do things different, plight to change, um, et cetera, it, they're the driving force. I, I quote the last five minutes of the sustainable officers presentation this morning, and, and the question of, you know, how are you all doing it? What are the questions you're asking? You're the ones who are doing it. You know, you're, you, you are the foot soldiers, as well as the people in the communities, programs like Sustainable Jersey. You know, that, that took you know, ten, 10 years to be to where it is today, but it's phenomenal where it was with, I think it's more than 50% of municipalities in the state of New Jersey having embraced sustainable practices and being recognized by Sustainable Jersey. Um, at DEP, we started a sustainable business program. The idea there was to work with our regulated entities, many of whom, and think at DEP, who's our regulated entities? It's folks who are doing you know, energy, so they have air issues, and they're, they're doing wastewater, and they're doing water. These are big players. So we started a green business practice program, a sustainable business practice program, and put these types of principles on the table to say, you can do it too. 
So, and if you do it, we're going to recognize you. You know, can government create incentive programs? You know, versus this is a big thing. You know, government loves to mandate. This is usually what I'm talking about every other day is government mandates. Government loves to mandate. Why not a paradigm shift? Why don't we incentivize good business conduct? Okay? People have good business practices. That's what makes them competitive. That's what drives profits. That's what drives sales. That's what gets a good workforce. You know, that's competition. That's enterprise. That's how it works. So that's a big paradigm of, of, of so you're the foot soldiers, communities the foot soldiers, and then we all together collectively have to keep you know, banging the drum on why this makes economic sense to do. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Um, as you look at synergies that happen, as you look at that big picture, just like the water conservation <coughs> and these uh, various initiatives, as we look at the infrastructure like Philadelphia's gas works, which are looking at spending billions of dollars over the next quarter to a half century to upgrade a system that hopefully what we really should be doing is weaning ourselves off of that fuel and energy efficiency in a very deep way, such as half a house or really deep platinum kind of building, cocooning whole neighborhoods in order to wean them off of it and connecting the dots between those um, in terms of, you know, that kind of stuff. So is there anything in your group that is looking at connecting those kinds of things just like the water? And then my second question is, how do we get our incentives to not to be, we'll give you some money to get to this minimum level of better, rather than ratcheting it up so that you get more money the deeper you go? Mm -hmm. So the, the answer to the first part of your question is all about balance. Um, because as much as I think, you know, many would like to say tomorrow let's live on renewables, it's just, it's not practical in the East Coast. It's not affordable, it's not practical. We can't, you know, we can't turn the sun on and we can't make the wind blow. Um, until we have really good uh, storage for energy, uh, it's, renewables are going to be, are going to be more of a challenge. That doesn't mean they don't play an extremely important part in the balance of energy, okay? So when we look that 10, 20, 30, 50 years forward, the idea of the more technology we have, the more innovation we have, the more we can wean ourselves off the natural stuff, um, and, and then you have to plan for that, and you gotta, you gotta set some sites, you're right, and you gotta work from there, you know, from there back and set some goals. In New Jersey, we have the Energy Master Plan. Um, there are some aggressive goals in the Energy Master Plan. You know, we can't ignore the fact from an economic side because we are just, you know, we're, we're out of a recession, and I can only speak for New Jersey. I mean, we, we are two years on the upward tra trajectory economically, okay, so that's great news. But we're not breaking the bank. We're not back to where we were pre-recession. So when it comes to the expense, we have to, we can't ignore the fact that natural gas is extremely affordable right now. Where does that fit into this balance? So how do we balance all these pieces of energy together? In New Jersey, we incentivize energy efficiency. In New Jersey, we have requirements for our utilities to take on energy efficiency. Um, we have our societal benefits charge and our clean energy bank. Um, and so we have projects and programs in New Jersey. One of the challenges, we don't have enough people taking advantage of them. And so education, again, you all, foot soldiers, you, you gotta keep doing the great job of educating and bringing more people to those, to those solutions. Okay, I forgot your second, I'm sorry. Um, it was incentivizing instead of to. Oh, incentives, uh, absolutely. Incentivize so that you actually encourage people to the deeper yes. results. Incent incentive programs can be um, written many, many different ways. Incentive programs should have goals in them, and you get your incentive when you hit a goal. And those goals should be good, good, lofty goals. Incentive programs should be based on return on investment. And when I say that, return on investment on an economic for the state. So the state, if the state's going to give out money, the state has to get something back. And usually that means creating some type of an economic paradigm. Is it new jobs? Is it um, more square footage that is being used? Is it environmental factors? So incentive programs have to figure out that, how we monetize the environmental side as, as well. Yes. Wondering, do you see with the use of uh, the emphasis on life cycle and the SROI? Do you see that um, transformation in our industry that people will see O and M as well as um, 
sustainability lead or path path and not an add-on or an afterthought, but actually part of the design process. Um, as well, uh, <coughs> you also see, uh, do you have any suggestions on how to change um, the mentality of the blue collar workforce in the sense that, oh, I've been doing this, you know, 50 years, copper pipe is the way to go, and if you want text, it's going to be an extra seven to ten thousand dollars. How do you, how do you transform an industry that knows what they're doing and deals and has their set ways and may not have access to the new technology or the equipment um, or the knowledge to use the equipment to install these new technologies? <coughs> So true asset management has uh, O&M built into it. So if you have, if you're, if you're driving the right asset management planning, which in the state of New Jersey we started doing on the water side, um, if you're driving the right planning, O&M is going to be built into it. It's got to be part of it. And when you're doing the life cycle, there are portions of it that are O&M, and then there is, and in five years I have to replace this, and 10 years I have to replace that, and 20 years I have to replace that. That's the idea of that long-term, that long, long-term plan. So it's, if it's, if it's set up right. It's built in, so that's the key. Let's make sure it's set up right. Um, you know, on, on the second part, yeah, it, everything is about education. When I say education, I mean bringing hard data to education. So it's one thing to shoot off a sound bite about, hey, this is really good because. It's another thing to put hard numbers up and show what the value of doing it is. Um, and so if we can educate from a hard data way, and we can put data in front of people and show them, no, this is what it means for you. Here is how you get your return on investment. But again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep echoing that there's got to be a balance between you know, cost and, and sustainability. We can't, we can't do it all at one time, and we have to look at these things in long term because as someone who's representative of business, you know, you know what I'm saying to my companies right now? I'm having the honest, the honest, transparent discussion with them. You know, if I would talk to them about infrastructure and say that we need to spend money as a state to do this, and this is what it's going to mean, you know, no, no, no. So if I'm a good advocate for my business, ordinarily, I'm putting my hands up and saying, no more costs on business in New Jersey. What's the honest discussion? Sitting with business and saying, a 20 to 30 year strategy. What does it look like? How much can you afford to put to it? And what else do you need to mitigate somewhere else in your balance sheet to get this done? We need to be at the table. We need to be having that discussion. Okay, so that's, that's how we're approaching it. So do you see, do you see the uh, incentive program uh, moving towards uh, rewarding people that are performance-based and actually, you know, one year after the project is done, doing the measurement verification saying, look, here are the real numbers. Yeah. Our, our energy efficiency programs in New Jersey are performance-based. They, they are. There are other incentives that might not be so much, but absolutely they are. I'm getting the high sign. I think you'll have to move on to your next session. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much.